gentlemen, dear colleagues, I have the honor to present some computer-based models of trade relations by the example of East Central Europe in early Middle Ages, or rather in the 11th century. In doing so, I am going to connect the relations with physical space. Before moving on to the actual topic, I would like to introduce you to the research area. You are now looking at the political geography of East Central Europe in the 11th century. To the west was the Holy Roman Empire, in the north Denmark, at the southern coast of the Baltic Sea between the rivers Elbe and Oder, different tribal communities like the ones of the Obertreeds and Lutizi can be found. Further east, you see the independent Emporium Wolin, adjoined by the Duchy of Pomerania, which was temporarily under Polish rule. <clears throat> the rising Piastic Poland is situated in the center of the map. The old Prussians settled northeast of them, and to the east was the Kievan Rus. In the southwest, parted through the Sudeten Mountains, lay the Przemyslidic Duchy of Bohemia and Moravian sub-principalities. Downwards, the Danube one came to the apartheid kingdom of Hungary. In most regions, proto-states had been built during the 10th century. Christianity gained ground and it came to an intensive inland colonization. <clears throat> the approaches to study trade relations in East Central Europe in the 11th century so far focused basically on the reconstruction of main traffic routes using retrospective methods by retransferring known late medieval routes and interpreting the distribution of selective finds connected to trade, like Overwegian slate or spherical weights. The advantage of these more or less loose associations is that the agency of the performer, as well as, as experiences and individual decision making, flows into the result. Nevertheless, the results are in so far unsatisfying that the several postulated routes run consistently different and the reasons of choosing one route are not comprehensible. <clears throat> it also remains untold how intense the flows between different regions were. Another possibility to study trade relations lies in generating and evaluating formal networks. My network concept includes that people act over broad distances and commodities move alongside routes. The network is represented through nodes and edges, as common. <clears throat> the aim is to capture the structure, intensity and direction of the commodity flows. Coin hoards are suited as nodes. On the one hand, they represent economically active regions in East Central Europe in the early Middle Ages. On the other hand, their distribution is closely connected to the function of coins as a general equivalent. Anyway, there are strong indicators that most of the silver coins were involved in economic trade actions at least once between their release and their acquisition or loss. This is suggested by the fact that the accumulated <coughs> coins origin from different coining sites and regions. Therefore, this leads to the conclusion that they often changed hands. Besides, there are almost no matching pieces among the many fragmented coins in one coin hoard. Metrological research proved that the fragmentation wasn't arbitrary, but took place in exactly identical weight units to use them in the commodity money trade system. As a tendency, one can state that the more the coins are fragmented, the further away from the coining sites they were found. It is also advantageous that the origin and date of the coins can regularly be identified and that they were often found by chance at agricultural work or forest operations at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. So they are rather independent of the status of the preservation and care of, of archaeological monuments in one region. 
Looking at the distribution of coin hoards, the question arises how the dots can be connected reasonably in order to create a network whose edges show economic flows. As one edge concept serve least cost distances, that physical distances had influence on contact frequencies may be beyond question. Most commonly, ecologists use linear distances. However, I would like to use least cost routes as edges on which the goods move. No exact routes shall be reconstructed, but the fact that mountains are an obstacle shall be included. Thereby, the relief is of essential significance. Slope exerts a powerful influence on the route selection processes of humans. If the terrain, terrain rises, the costs across it increases. Almost all least cost paths analyzes an ecology based on this idea, even so other costs are considered as well. The hiking function of Tobler was used as cost function. On the one hand, because it, had, it has been tested on obtaining proper results, on the other hand, it ensures a comparability because it's used often in least cost analysis. On the basis of graph theoretical considerations, networks can be built of the least cost distances. To the left, you see a triangle meshing, the so-called Delaunay network, which is often used in ecology as a basic transport network, or to the right, a minimum spanning tree network that has a high efficiency by running through all nodes. We've seen both of them before in other talks. The problems of previous applications can be summed up in the following way. Often, the application is limited to one method. In many cases, there's a lack of explanation for using these methods. More often, it lacks explanations of the variables and thresholds used, and the models are often extremely static. <clears throat> More flexible than the network models shown before are, for example, distance-based networks because the thresholds, in this case, the absolute distances, can be re regulated up and down fluently. The idea behind this is that nodes are only in contact until a certain maximum distance. Under the aspect of flexibility, beta skeletons have proven to be favorable. Other than, for example, in the proximal point analysis or the minimum spanning tree networks, besides the distances, the geometrical order of the nodes plays an essential role in networks based on beta skeletons. For every pair of nodes, an influence area is determined whose form and extent depend on the value beta and the relative position of neighboring nodes. Two nodes are connected if all angels between both nodes and another neighboring node, no, <coughs> node are sharper than the threshold, which is ex expressed through the numeric parameter beta. The higher the value beta, the lesser is the number of edges in one network. It slowly comes decomposed. Another possibility for generating networks other than through neighborhood networks of physical distance would be through similarities of the composition of the coin finds. You can see one medal over there. <coughs> the individual coin hoards are allocated to coining sites in case they contain coins from them. If there are coins from Prague and Regensburg in one coin hoard, the dot symbol is connected to the box symbol for the mints of Prague and Regensburg. The similarity between the nodes is expressed through the number of connections. Nodes, here coin hoards and coining sites, which are more strongly connected, lie closer to each other than those which are lesser or not connected. Thanks to the topology, one can see which nodes have similar characteristics and which have a weak or strong position. On this basis, one can see that Regensburg and Prague had close contact. There are also many coin hoards which contain coins from Eshtergom, as well as those from Olomutz, which indicate strong exchange and communication relations between both places. In both cases, the increased interaction comes along with geographical closeness of both urban settlement. This also applies to the places of Hedeby, Sigtuna and Lund. Surprisingly, Meissen finds itself very close to Lund an orientation towards the north seems to become apparent. 
The Piastic centers Gniezno, Krakow, and Wrocław are overall relatively weak networked, which can be explained by their little coinage. Therefore, their, their connection to other places does not accord with their real connection. This also applies to the significance of these early urban settlements in the exchange and communication network. In contrast, the central position in the exchange and communication relations in East Central Europe for the places Magdeburg, Regensburg and Prague shown in the two-mode Cohen network can be assumed to be real. For now, we have seen several possibilities of generating different exchange networks with fluent thresholds. Now the question is how to receive an ideal network. In this regard, different assumptions can be tested. The first is that the network is best, which has the most correlations between the physical distances and the similarity distances. The second is that the network is best in which the estimated edges correlate with the interaction corridors known from written sources. To get significance and accordance values, one can perform correlations. Details shall be left out here. On the slide, you can see the most promising exchange network determined in comparison to two different methods, which you can here see on the slide. After we generated a probable geographical exchange network, the question of its structures and mechanisms arises. To find out which edges are of high or low significance for the exchange relations, one normally uses the between centrality. The test shows at first glance that this method is suitable to show good connections between groups, but not to get a weighted overall interaction network. So this is the between the centrality here for the rules, not for the nodes. <clears throat> this is why I combined the values of between this with our indexes. On the one hand, I did a kernel density estimation of the nodes because a high geographical density of coin accumulations testifies a high density density of interaction. By the way, you can also use explicit network analytical techniques like click clustering or modularity clustering to achieve similar results. On the other hand, I computed stream courses in GIS, which I, cl which I classified by the method of Strala. This is to say that the Strala stream order is used to define stream size and importance based on a hierarchy of tributaries. These classified streams are taken into account due to the fact that water routes have been major means of distribution for goods in former times. Taking all these factors together, one obtains an overall weighted interaction network, which you can see on a slide. Another question that arises <clears throat> with trade networks is set of temporality. In the case of networks based on coin hoards, chronological dynamics can be established easily by dating the depositions using the respective youngest coin. Dividing the 11th century into two equal periods, you can see, for example, that considerably more exchange relations are shown in the region of Poznan and Gniezno in the first half of the 11th century than in the second. Simultaneously, one can see that the activities around Krakow increases in the course of time. This change can be correlated to written sources. In the year 1038, Casimir the Restorer, the Duke of Poland, relocates his seat from Greater Poland to Krakow. Okay, this uh, uh, slide is not really the best because uh, the images are so uh, are not uh, high, big enough. <coughs> Besides an overall East Central European interaction network, it is of interest how the goods spread from individual locations. Simulations can give us an impression of these. For example, using the cost distance of the weighted network, one can simulate the spreading of goods from Hamburg. Mapping the actual distribution of coins from Hamburg against the simulation, a clear accord with the green network parts is visible which are identified as a probable area of widespread goods from Hamburg. <clears throat> Although the fine spots increase towards the direction of the darker green area, meaning the simulated main distribution area. 
a similar dense correlation can be found between the simulated spreading of goods and coin finds concerning other places. Therefore, it seems legit to predict directions of impact, intensity, and spatial dimensions of trade relations for places without mints and thus without a possibility of evaluati evaluating the coin distribution. So another refinement of the model can be done by estimating the ideal least cost routes between the mint and the coins in the network. A classification into important and unimportant routes can be done by line density estimation. In this regard, it is assumed that many parallel running routes are corridors with a higher interaction and vice versa. <clears throat> so let me conclude. The task of this lecture was to highlight the structure, direction and intensity of economic relations in East Central Europe in the 11th century by using techniques of formal network analysis. Coin hoards function as nodes and least cost distances and similarities as edges of which flexible network models have been built by using graph theoretical concepts. To check these models and find the optimal network hypothesis, tests were done. With different network analytical and spatial statistical methods, weightings come to the network, enabling us to make interaction flows of different strengths and different space-time configurations visible. <clears throat> so, concerning patterns of commodity flows, many different methods and models can be applied. The variety of hints which could be given on best practice is every bit as diverse as modeling tasks. At the end, I would like to note some points which I assume to be especially important. Firstly, flexible networks models are more suitable than static ones because they better adapt to past realities. Secondly, do it as simple as necessary. You won't necessarily learn more about the data <clears throat> the more methods you use in analysis. Avoid similar methods, which will lead to similar and therefore redundant results. Thirdly, do hypothesis testing. Try to find out how likely the generated network models are and which of them are the most probable. Last but not least, I would like to name some collections of network analysis tools, which I consider to be very helpful for ecologists. Many of them can be found in the open source package iGraph, which can be programmed in R, for example. Some useful tools are also compiled by the project Spatial Ecological Data Analysis with R. With this, I would like to end my talk. Thank you for your attention.